just released a report from the Vatican on the sex abuse scandal, the steps the church is taking to move forward. The 2016 election season begins. We'll tell you what's at stake in today's primaries. Praying for protection for those who protect us. I'm Jason Calvi, all of that story next. And later, we go Old Testament, the new find that has archeologists excited. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for this primary Tuesday, May 6th, 2014. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick with the EWTN News Nightly team. We begin looking at news now, starting with a first of its kind report from the Vatican, detailing how it is dealing with claims of sexual abuse of children by priests. The Vatican's ambassador to the UN in Geneva, Archbishop Sivano Tomasi, just revealed that over the past decade, nearly 850 priests have been removed from the clerical state for abuse. The church imposed lesser severe sanctions on some 24 or 2,500 other priests. We talked with Archbishop Tomasi from Geneva by phone this afternoon, and he says the church has been and will continue to be proactively working to end abuse of children. The Holy See has acted with determination because it wants to clean up the house, prevent any further abuse of minors, and uh, help the victims and start again a new page in the journey of the church. And here in our studios, Father Carter Griffin joins us now to talk about how seminaries in the U.S. are moving beyond the mistakes of the past. Father Griffin is vocations director for the Archdiocese of Washington and serves at St. John Paul II uh, Seminary. Father Griffin, what is being done in seminaries today to weed out abusers, and how is it different from before all this came to light? Well, I think the main thing and the first thing is uh, just being very uh, aggressive and proactive on uh, who comes into the seminary, you know, looking at them very closely from a psychological point of view as well as a spiritual point of view, making sure that uh, I think we've, we've learned a lot. We've just grown in our understanding of uh, uh, the sexual abuse and the sexual abuse crisis and, 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 and who we're looking for in the priesthood. So I think that's the first step, is who comes into the seminary, making sure that there's very natural, normal, healthy drives for uh, marriage and a family are, are what we have, you know, and men in the seminary, and those can then be uh, sort of lifted up and, and, and directed towards being a supernatural father. Um, and taking that fatherhood seriously is an important part of this. I mean, fathers don't abuse their children, you know, and, and really forming men to be good and faithful and generous fathers is an important part of what we're doing. But with all the media attention on this abuse scandal, how do you overcome that when you're talking with young men about the priesthood? Well, you know, the media has, uh, has in a sense, done us a great service, you know, and mm. uh, the media has, has exposed, first of all, exposed something that has been hurting children, you know, and, and uh, I think it's something that clearly it doesn't exist simply in the Catholic Church or among Catholic priests. It's a larger problem. Uh, I don't know if society at large has really taken that part of it seriously, but I think it could. But certainly we can do our part, you know, and, and protect the children in the Catholic Church uh, in a special way from priests. And so part of it is these, these men come wide-eyed. They know what they're getting into. They know some of the challenges that have, uh, that, that, uh, you know, that, that, ex that is exposed to the priesthood right now. Um, and they're not, they're not naive about that. You know? And in some ways, a lot of these guys, and in fact, ones at John Paul II Seminary would be a good example of this, uh, really want to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. They want to go out there and, and they're joyful, uh, intelligent, vibrant, uh, really faithful young men, you know, and they want to go out there and, and make a difference in the world. And, and that's what we need today more than anything. Are they getting the support of their families, of their fellow parishioners in this? Yes, I think they are, to be sure. I mean, some of the families uh, certainly have a, an understanding of the priesthood, which is limited somewhat by what the media has said. Um, but as they've come to know other seminarians, they see their own sons grow into mature young men, and they see the formation and the results of the formation process. Uh, many of them have become some of our greatest supporters. You know, it's a beautiful thing to see. Father Carter Griffin, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having Look me. Forward Thanks, to having Brian. you back. Now, some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. The midterm election season kicks off today. The primary contest will help decide who will face off in November's general election. Now, this vote is critical as Democrats and Republicans fight for control of Congress. North Carolina, Ohio, and Indiana held their spring primaries today. Ohio is perhaps the most critical of the three, always considered a battleground state. 
One of Ohio's contested congressional seats belonged to House Speaker John Boehner. Ohio's Republican Governor John Kasich is also trying to hang on to his seat. Both are considered possible 2016 presidential contenders, but they say they're focused right now on re-election. So does today's vote mean anything for people who don't live in those states or inside the Beltway? We have Elaine K. Marcus, Senior Fellow at the Governance Studies Program at Brookings Institution with us now. And besides Boehner and Kasich, what do you think are the most important races in today's primary? Well, the other really important race is the Republican race in North Carolina. Because Why is that? Kay Hagan, who's the Democratic senator in North Carolina, is widely believed to be one of the more vulnerable Democrats in the Senate. So if she draws a weak Republican opponent, then she has a better chance of succeeding. The Republicans uh, learned their lesson from past primaries where they nominated weak candidates and consequently lost Senate races that were potentially theirs. They're really trying hard not to do that this time because they would like to pick up the six seats that they need to win the Senate. Yeah, the only thing that a, that a candidate wins in a primary is a chance to run again in the Absolutely. general election. But these are critical elections to the balance of power in the House and Senate, aren't they? Oh, listen, primaries are the name of the game. I mean, one of the things we've been doing at Brookings is trying to educate people to the fact that in this day and age, when so many states are either red or blue, and even more congressional dist districts are red or blue, if you want to have an impact, you've got to vote in the primaries. And voting in primaries is very, very low. Very few people even know they're happening. So we think it's really important to participate in primaries. Do you think there are any candidates in the primary races today, more specifically, but generally, that could be a real liability to their party? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, plenty? yeah. Plen there's plenty. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, mostly the, that, that analysis is concentrated on the Tea Party. Um, and the Tea Party has been incredible, you know, if strong faction within the Republican Party. But in their infancy, what they did was they recruited some candidates who were really flawed, right, who had background problems in their background, problems with their resume. The most famous one probably was the Delaware Senate candidate a few years ago mm -hmm. who declared herself to be a witch. I mean, you know, there were... so. What's happened now is that the Republican Party is very concerned about having what we call quality candidates so that they can at least go into the general election with a fighting chance against the Democrats. And that, that's a, it's a very big concern for both parties, but we've seen it more recently in the Republican Party. All right. Elaine K. Mark from the Brookings Institution, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, the tension in the Ukraine continues to build after more deadly violence in the eastern part of that nation. 30 pro-Russia insurgents and four government troops have been killed, this according to the Interior Ministry. There were gun battles around the city of Slavyansk yesterday, and in the eastern city of Donetsk, the government has ordered the airport there to cancel its international flights. A bishop in South Sudan is asking for protection after he says a Catholic hospital was bombed by a Sudanese warplane over the past couple of days. This news video reportedly shows a Sudanese jet flying over the Nuba Mountains and Mother of Mercy Catholic Hospital. You can see scared residents of this area running for cover. It's the only functioning hospital in that part of southern Sudan. The area has a long history of fighting between government and rebel opposition. By targeting our hospital, I told the president, you are targeting our Muslim and Christian brothers and sisters, as well as continuing the religious oppression of the Catholic Church in the Sudan. The Sudanese bishop decried the bombings at a news conference today in Nairobi. Right now, six people are recovering in southern China after a knife attack at a busy train station. Police arrived on the scene at the attackers were slashing passengers. Officers shot and subdued a male suspect who was carrying a knife. It is the third high-profile attack on civilians at a Chinese train station in a little more than two months. Last week, a suicide bombing at a train station left three people dead and 79 injured. In March, a group of men and women slashed at crowds at a railway station, killing 29 people. Police killed four attackers in that incident. A chaotic scene in a suburban neighborhood north of Denver after a small plane crashed into a house. 
Nobody was home when the crash happened Monday afternoon. The pilot escaped with only minor injuries. The pilot was able to extract himself miraculously from the plane and walk out. The plane was towing an advertising banner at the time, and investigators aren't sure yet if there was a problem with the plane or the banner before that crash. In Oklahoma, firefighters are making progress now in the battle to get a wildfire under control that blazes right now in Guthrie. It's about 30 minutes north of Oklahoma City. Firefighters have about 90 percent of the fire contained, but hot temperatures and strong winds could be the perfect ingredients for it to rekindle. The National Weather Service has issued a red flag fire alert for parts of the state. We are learning more tonight about what may have caused a circus accident in Rhode Island where eight acrobats plummeted to the ground. A public safety official says a metal clip known as a carabiner failed. That carabiner failed. It was a single piece of equipment that failed. We don't know yet if the broken clip was the sole cause of Sunday's accident. Investigators are still trying to determine why it snapped. Police say three of the men injured or the people injured are in serious condition. The rest are in good condition tonight. This evening, a convicted robber is finally free, despite not really spending much time in prison at all. A judge said this week that Mike Anderson is free to go. Now, you might remember all of the media attention that Anderson received over the past few weeks. A jury convicted him of robbery in 2000, but because of a clerical error, prison officials didn't have him report to prison until they were working on his release paperwork last year and realized he was never even told to surrender. But because Anderson stayed out of trouble for 13 years after his conviction, the judge decided to let him go. Anderson and his family are excited to have this behind them. I'm very, very, very happy. Very happy. And again, I thank everybody for all their support. The judge was able to free Anderson by giving him credit for the time he was being a good citizen while living outside of prison. Well, dedicated to service, a look at the men who have just vowed allegiance to the Pope. That's coming up. But first, a solemn celebration honoring our first responders. EWTN News Nightly's Jason Calvi attended the Blue Mass today in Washington, D.C. Jason? Every day they walk into fire, rescue the injured, and fight crime. But sometimes, they never return home. More than 100 police officers and 100 firefighters died in the line of duty last year, including Deputy Sheriff Billy Ray Griggs. Today, those who still wear the blue remember their fallen brothers and sisters. Be very sad, but honored to be here today to thank them for their service to the community, to the people in their hometowns, and to their families. And today, the protectors also pray for protection. With all of our best efforts, everything is still in the control of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. So my faith is what keeps us going every day. It's the Blue Mass. The name comes from the blue uniforms of first responders. Firefighters and officers from city, county, and state, FBI, Secret Service, and Interpol agents, among many, many others, join in this annual Mass. You'll find Blue Masses in several dioceses across the country, but the very first one took place in 1934 at this parish, St. Patrick's in Washington, D.C. The Archdiocese of Washington re-picked up that tradition back in the 90s. Well, it's beautiful and we appreciate the community trying to give back in that spirit. Uh, we're here to serve and we love serving the community. These heroes leave here knowing that any time they put on the blue could be their last. In Washington, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Dedicated to service, a look at the young men who have just vowed allegiance to the Pope. And the restoration of Rome's ancient Colosseum is nearly complete. A sneak peek next. A society which abandons children and the elderly severs its roots and darkens its future. A tweet from the Twitter account of Pope Francis today. You're watching EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. It was a big day at the Vatican for a group of special young men. They are the newest members of the Swiss Guard, that elite force that's provided security at the Vatican since 1506. News Nightly's Alan Holdren was there as they took their oath to protect the Pope and serve the church. Swiss. Catholic, all between 19 and 30 years old. They're the class of 2014. Today, these 30 new Swiss guards ask for the protection of the saints as they swore to faithfully serve the popes. Here 
Here below the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican's courtyard of San Damaso, the rich history and the future of the Pontifical Swiss Guard are on display. Today they're taking the public oath to protect the Pope at all costs. The year 2012, I was in the Swiss Army and there I write the letter to come here to the Swiss Guard and one year later I'm here and my, I make my job for the Pope Francis. My friends, they aren't Catholic like me, but um, they say, hey, it's a cool job, what you can do. Not everyone can say hello to the Pope or can protect the Pope. I will give 100% 100, 100 for the Pope, for all the Popes and now for Pope Francis. The ceremony is always at the 6th May. 6th May 1527 was the sack of Rome means that the Swiss gods had to, to protect the Pope Clement the, the, the seventh, and, but the, most of the Swiss gods lost her life. That's the reason why we are the recording that the remembering day of the 6th May, we use it also to promise again in the, this way to do the same like soldier 1527 has done. Swear means Swear for the Pope means to give him everything, means also the life when it needs. So it's a, it's a commitment, it's a strong commitment to do everything for the Holy Father. The new guards are now fully part of the smallest army on earth. Alan Holdren in Rome, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks a lot, Alan. Pope Francis held a special audience for the new recruits ahead of today's ceremony. He greeted the new members and their families of the Vatican yesterday and recalled, as the captain of the guard told us, that May 6 marks the day when nearly 150 Swiss guards died while fighting during the sack of Rome. That battle allowed Pope Clement VII to escape to safety. The Pope thanked the guards for their commitment and blessed them. The new members wore the Swiss Guard's famous blue, yellow and red uniforms and helmets with red plumes. The guards have been wearing this unique, colorful uniform for 100 years now. The restoration of one of the world's most famous attractions is almost complete. This is also in Rome. In a few weeks, the team that has been cleaning and repairing the Colosseum in Rome will remove the scaffolding and reveal the ancient amphitheater. Years of neglect and layers of pollution had taken its toll on this monument, but a small and dedicated group of restorers has been working diligently, entirely by hand, inch by inch. They're bringing the Colosseum back to its original glory days, when powerful Roman emperors decided the fate of gladiators. The last phase of this restoration cost about $35 million. The Colosseum has been attracting millions of tourists for centuries and has been designated a world heritage by the United Nations. And an Israeli archaeologist is making quite a claim about a biblical king. Eli Shukran says he has found the citadel captured by King David in his conquest of Jerusalem. They claim, that claim rather, is rekindling a debate about using the Bible as a field guide to identifying ancient ruins. It's the latest in a string of announcements by Israeli archaeologists saying they have unearthed palaces of the legendary biblical king. King David is revered in Jewish religious tradition for establishing Jerusalem as its central holy city, but he has long eluded historians looking for clear-cut evidence of his existence and reign. This latest claim is disputed by some other archaeologists. Up next, a stirring concert celebrates our two new Pope Saints. Maestro Sir Gilbert Levine joins us on set tonight and a masterpiece up for auction. How much you'll have to shell out for this Norman Rockwell painting. That story and more just ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back to EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, May 6th. And tonight we have a special treat, a musical celebration of Saints John Paul II and John XXIII was held last night right here in Washington. Pope John Paul II's maestro of 17 years, American Sir Gilbert Levine, conducted performances by the Carnegie Hall Orchestra, the Washington Choral Arts Society, and the Krakow Philharmonic Choir. The theme was the Pope's common commitment to reach out to people of all faiths, one of the priorities of Vatican II. Before the concert, Cardinal Donald Wuerl highlighted that. One of the things that the council opened up and one of the things that both of these two holy men did was focus on reconciliation, focus on the need of all of us to be able to respect one another, work with one another, and come to know one another a lot better. In that spirit, singers and ambassadors from Poland, Italy, and Argentina came to represent the native countries of three popes. 
Joining us tonight, the man leading the orchestra, Sir Gilbert Levine. And Sir Gilbert, Pope John Paul II had a special name for you, didn't he? He called me Nash Maestro, our maestro. And we refer to you sometimes as the Pope's maestro. You called him friend. What I is never it did. like? I never did. It's very important. Cardinal Jeevish, in 2009, I could never imagine calling the Pope a friend. In 2009, Cardinal Jewish gave an interview for Polish television and was asked in Polish about our relationship. And he said, there developed between the Holy Father and the Maestra, as he was called in Rome, a deep spiritual friendship. That is the first time I had ever allowed myself to hear or thought to utter that phrase. Because the notion of a pope and a friend, let alone a Jewish friend, <laughs> made no sense to me. But you do I think of him as a friend, don't you? I, I, feel, an, I, I feel an incredible close to, closeness to him as a human being, as he treated me from the very first time I met him in his private library as a fellow human being. And he made me feel that commonality of our humanness. Well, I feel close to him being close to you, and I know how much he had this passion for the arts, especially for music. He came to understand that music could be a language. I believe that I walked into his life in the middle of a quest that he was on. How do I bring peoples of different faiths together? What is the language I can use that will do this? He came from a home in Vadovica that was in the middle, 30% of Vadovica was Jewish. He came from an environment where the friends he made in school because he had so little money were mostly all Jewish. He didn't have the money to go to parochial school. So the future pope was the soccer, was the goalie on the soccer team of the Jews. And I met him, and I believe in his mind he was looking for a way, and by the way, most of those people were murdered in the Holocaust. Real Ironic. friends. Ironic. Most of, the, of his soccer buddies were murdered. He stayed close to others throughout his entire life. Yes, he did. Jerzy Kluger, uh, Kluger particularly was a, was a Jew who came uh, to live in Rome when he became Pope. Mm -hmm. But I believe that, that what I found was this search, that he was looking for a language, and that he came to know through me over the first three years of what was a 17-year relationship, which is unbelievable even when I say it, that language maybe could be this way. And he called it the way. And that music would be a way to bring us all together in harmony. That, that Jews, first Jews, he wanted to find a way for the Catholic Church and the Jewish people to come to an at one minute, to be together. And, and that process began in him, and he began to think and trust that my art could be that way. And that harmony so beautifully reflected in this concert, which will air on PBS, won't it, worldwide? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. What a beautiful concert, and what a great gift to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Sir Gilbert Levine, thanks for joining us. Well, it's a moment captured in time by a world-renowned artist, and now we're getting another look. Take a look at this Norman Rockwell painting. It's of five Boston Red Sox players. The art first appeared in the 1957 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. As prominent as Norman Rockwell is, at least one of the players didn't know that the man painting him was the da Vinci of his day. We didn't even know who Norman Rockwell was. We, he was, we were told to take our uniforms to Stockbridge and uh, meet this man, and he was going to take pictures of us, and then, so we had to drive all the way out there and drive all the way back on our day off. The painting will soon be up for auction. If you're planning to bid on it, by the way, you better be prepared to cough up a lot of cash. It's expected to go for 20 to $30 million. Well, it was a night for fashion in New York City. Lots of celebrities attended the Metropolitan Museum of Art Gala, including First Lady Michelle Obama. She helped open the new Costume Institute at the Met last night, explaining the importance of the center. The Met will be opening up the world of fashion like never before. And that's really the mission of this new space, to show that fashion isn't an exclusive club for the few who can attend a runway show or shop at certain stores. This center is for 
anyone who is curious about fashion and how it impacts our culture and our history. The Institute contains more than 35,000 costumes and accessories. That's all for tonight. We encourage you to watch us tomorrow night and every night of the week. We're on five days a week now, so we'll see you tomorrow. You can catch us anytime on YouTube. I'm Brian Patrick for all of us at EWTN News Nightly. Good night and God bless you.